Yours. Thanks. Uh, welcome again. Uh, yeah, searching for a keynote is always uh, one of the uh, major quests the program committee is, uh, has got. Uh, but uh, there, there is a guy that I met like 20 years ago. Uh, I still know that that was in San Diego when I was at the Lisa, and it was probably my first Lisa, Usenix Lisa. And there was this uh, tutorial on doing Perl for sysadmin. I know nothing about Perl. I know a little. I knew a little about sysadmin. I did that for like two years at that very moment. I went in that packed tutorial room where this guy was speaking and was teaching how to do great things with a little less great language, I thought, at that very time. So that was the moment I met David Blank Elliman. And he's iconic in Usenix for being on the board, being a, a founder of a, a series of conferences, which the next incarnation will be, the Europe incarnation will be in Amsterdam next year. Shameless plug here. Um, the SRE con, he's going to talk about SRE stuff, SRE thingies. So like migrating from being the, the normal sysadmin to SRE stuff, which is like happening now all the time in the big companies. Uh, and he's really entertaining and fun. So I thought, well, let's get him here. So without further ado, well, David, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning. Heard it was the Netherlands, heard you were welcoming. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Now that sounds really good. So hello, my name is David Blank Edelman, and I want to first apologize for not giving this entirely in Dutch. Uh, I went online to eBay to purchase a very inexpensive correspondence course in Dutch. It left out the G. Um, and as a result, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this in Dutch. Um, but maybe later, who knows? So uh, it is my pleasure to talk to you. It'll be even more my pleasure when I switch this so it actually switches things. Oh, yeah, I've successfully played the music again. Here we go. So what I want to talk to you today about is reliability, this big, hairy beast of a thing that uh, we are all fairly familiar with. Um, we're familiar with it because it's the thing that tends to keep us up at night. It's the thing that, that we find that we lay in bed trying to sleep because we're just trying to figure out how do we get things to do what we want to, how to get things working away. But ironically, it is also um, the thing that wakes us up at night. And I'm using this little ringtone, which I don't know if you could hear. I just thought it would be appropriate for where I was. Um, I'm, I apologize for those of you who start to twitch when you hear that particular ringtone. Uh, because you've heard it so much in your life. But the problem is, is that reliability is the thing, and we'll turn this all the way down. Yeah, stop now, please, please. Um, th this is, the problem here is, is that reliability is also the thing that wakes you up at night. It's the thing that causes you to get paged at 2 a.m. or to be on the phone to the office when you're on vacation or causes you to be in the data center on, on a day when you should be with your family. I know this from experience. Um, and so what I, it, it's also the thing that causes these really angry dashboards, right, which you've all seen, right? Or even worse, sometimes it causes these really anger twi tweets, you know, in social media. And so the good news is I'm kind of here to talk to you, and I'm, now I realize this looks very marketing, but there it is. I'm here to talk to you about lessons that I've learned from site reliability engineering and to give you a sense of what it is. So in order to do that, what I want to do is just do a really quick poll of two things. Let me ask the obvious question, which is how many people in the room have heard of site reliability engineering? Oh, that really makes me happy. How many people in the room consider themselves a site reliability engineer or have that as, as their title? So there are three or two people who've raised their hands, please go to them after the talk and make sure that what I said was correct. 
Um, they're there to make sure, they're there to help you along these lines. Okay, let's do another one that's just fun for me. I would like to understand how long you've been doing what you've been doing in this business. I assume that most of us are in sort of the operations space. Is that a correct assumption? Can you raise your hand if you consider yourself somewhere in the operations space? System in Oh, yeah. Oh, my people. It's so good to see you. Um, <laughs> Um, let's do a quick thing, just because it's fun for me, because I'm old. Uh, how many people have been doing this for a year or a year, let's say, or less than a year? Nobody. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Two to five years. Welcome, youngins. I wanted, to, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so good to see you. Uh, five to ten. So let's try that. More. Ten to fifteen. Even more. 10, let's say, let's, uh, well, I, I, I had to move the, the range, I realized. Um, 15 to 20. Yeah, 20 to 25. Even more. Okay, uh, let's go 25 to 30. Greater than 30 years. Yeah, let's get together after this and talk about how we used to shovel coal into the servers. <laughs> Back in the day, those were, those were good days. Okay, so let's talk about what SRE is. Let's talk about site reliability engineering. I'm so glad we can start now. You came, it's really good. Plenty of seats right near me. <laughs> I won't pop, make fun of you, you're right next to me. So let's talk about what SRE is. This is my best definition of what site reliability engineering is. I consider site reliability engineering to be an engineering discipline that is devoted to helping an organization sustainably achieve the appropriate level of reliability for their systems, services, products, et cetera. There are three words in this definition that I want to pull out that I want to talk more about that I think help make a definition uh, sort of stuff. I'd be curious if you could pick which the three are. And hey, let's try that for fun. This is going to be a fun day. Let's try it. Raise your hand if you want to guess one of the words. Go ahead. Appropriate. Appropriate. Oh, I love you. Sustainable. Sustainable. What's the third? Engineering. Engineering's really good. One want to hit me with the next one? I'll tell you which one I want to talk about next. No, nope. And it's also not the in, but that would be good too. Discipline, no, that'd be, so this is so nice because you're all finding your own meaning in here. The first word I want to talk about here is reliability. <laughs> I know, it's a big one, it's a, it's a guess, right? Um, it's the thing that's in the middle of site reliability engineering, right in, the, right in the middle of this sort of stuff. So the reason why I want to talk about reliability is you all have the sense that if you don't have reliability in your systems, services, and products, um, then you can start to lose money, that's pretty obvious, right? If the things that you're doing don't work, or let's say they're meant to make money for the company, that's pretty obvious. You can lose time, right, because outages are unplanned work. All that work that you hope to get done today or this week just went down the toilet, right? You can lose reputation. If your systems and services and stuff like that aren't working, people are going to go to, other, to, your, to your competitors. It's just obvious. And I think it is important to note that you can also lose your health. If you're being woken up at 2 a.m., if you're on the phone to your family, on the phone instead of being with your family, um, if, you, if you're, the term in, the idiom in the U.S. would be hair on fire, what is, there, must be, there must be a Dutch term for this. You have, you have such great terms, such great idioms. Is there a version of hair on fire? Do you know what I mean when I say that? Can you, can you immediately get that? Meaning that everything is, everything is always in crisis. And so your hair is on fire and you're running from one place to another. Come up with the, come up with the Dutch version and then tell me later, please. I... Okay, you're going to ask me to repeat that because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> nice try. Chicken, chicken without a head's not bad. There's a, it's a little bit of a... Uh, okay, we're all agreeing on this. I don't know what, that, what he said, but every, every, I agree with you. That sounds great. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay, what does it mean? We, we can't go any further until we, if we get this... Extinguishing fire, yeah, but there's a something to it. Okay, um, the other thing that you're going to lose is hiring, right? Where every, I, I would dare say that many of the people in this room represent a company that is trying to hire, right? And it is the case that if that people in this industry, the people in this room, talk to each other, and so as a result, if your environment is terrible, other people know, and nobody wants to work for. Again, here's another idiom from the U.S.: tire fire. There must be another good expression for that in Dutch. I'm certain there's an expression for that in Dutch. Um, so 
the thing is, is you can spend a lot of money, you can spend a lot of time, you can do all these things, um, but if you don't have a reliable system, it kind of goes in the trash. And I have another one of these that's a toilet, if you want me to use that animation <laughs> instead. Uh, but, you know, as corporate, corporate pictures go. Um, one of the CTOs at Microsoft in enterprise services said to me that, you know, the thing is, is that you can have all of the bells and whistles in the world, but it does you no good if the bells cannot be rung and the whistles cannot be blown. Right? And I think that's, that's what I feel about this. Okay, let's go back to this. Um, the person who said the word appropriate, I would kiss you on the lips if I wasn't giving a speech um, right now. The thing that I think that's really important to understand that Essary brings to the conversation is the notion that there might be an appropriate level of reliability for your systems. Once upon a time, it was the case that we were focused on making sure that our systems ran 24-7 every day, every week, every month, every year. But except for those systems that like beat in your chest, I'm trying to get this thing to go boom, 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 right? Or the things that fly, which I really would like to be 100% reliable because I, I have to go back. Um, uh, you probably don't need 100%. And in fact, it's almost, it's very difficult to get to 100% if even possible. I'll give you an example of that. Everybody in this room runs systems that have dependencies on other systems. I'm certain of that. Right? So maybe it's a payment processor or maybe it's your authentication system. If they're not up 100% of the time and they often are not, chances are you aren't either. And that can be really difficult. The other thing I want to say is that if we're shooting for 100% reliable, you have no headroom. And what that means in a lot of ways is uh, you can't make any changes that might cause you to have any downtime at all. And that's not a way to run systems. And it's difficult. So, the last one I want to say here, um, I, I feel sorry that I have to say this, but I have to say this in other countries too. The Netherlands gets this really well. You must create a sustainable operations practice, one that allows you to have the people do good work and come to work to bring their best. Because reliable systems are not built by burnt out people. Right? Reliable systems are not built by people that, that, can't, that haven't been able to sleep, they can't think, right? So it's really crucial that we build something that is sustainable. And like I said, the thing that I love when I come here is that you understand this so deeply. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the core principles and practices. Well, let's get right to the, to the sort of the, uh, uh, the French fries of the thing. No, let me think. What would be the right, again, idiom here. Okay, so here's a few core principles. There are, you know, this is like standards, where they say the good thing about standards is if you don't like these, I have others. Um, that's the way I feel about this as well. So the first thing is pretty obvious. We've talked about that Esri's focus is laser on reliability. It's the thing in the system that site reliability engineers pay a lot of attention to. And I always say that one of the nice ways you can tell a site reliability engineer is they will walk into a room that has an architectural diagram on the whiteboard, and before they sit down, they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's a single point of failure, and what are you going to do about that? over there. You know, it's a, little bit like, it's a little bit like security people who think differently, right? They see it, like they just see stuff because that's what they pay attention to. The other thing I want to say is that site reliability engineering starts with their mind in production. What do I need to do to create a production environment that's reliable? How will changes that I'm about to make to my deployment process or anything like that affect the reliability of my production environment? What do I need to monitor? So it's all about production. Um, obviously, we think a lot about scale and complexity and lots of other things as well, but, but one of the things that this comes out of is um, you don't scale linearly, right? But your systems are going to scale up, so what are you going to do about it? I think it's important to mention that the only way to get any of that is to use engineering and architecture versus just throwing darts at a wall. Right? It's really, really important to, to engineer your way out, out you know, into the job you want. Um, and again, we use tech, but we respect people's role in the socio-technical th systems that we run, that we are part of. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's one of the secrets of SRE that I'm going to give to you that you can take back to you. In my opinion, creating the right feedback loops in your organization is the thing that will help you tend towards greater reliability. Okay? And I'm going to give you some specific examples that you can take home and play at home. You know, it's the play-at-home play game. Let you take a picture or make an oil painting or perhaps 
perhaps you know, like a, a, an etching, if you'd like. I'm totally fine with that. Um, I'm just going to warn you that I like, to, I like slides that build on each other, so I'm happy to tell you when to take the picture, because usually what happens is people will be out here going like this, and, they, and like I'll switch to the, the next part of the slide and be like, damn, and then I like click, and, like, and I'll switch to the next slide and be like, ah, you know, and I start to, people start to groan. So if you want, I'll let you know. I'll even take selfies with some of the slides if you want. <laughs> totally fine to do that if you'd like. Okay, so here are three of the practices that I'm hoping to talk a little bit about with you today. Um, SLIs and SLOs, operational balance, and learning from failure. So let's dive into SLIs and SLOs, service level indicators and service level objectives. If you've heard these three letters together uh, in your life before, can you raise your hands? That's amazing. This is great. So let's see if we can level set on this. For those of you who haven't heard about this, you're in for a treat. But what I want to do is I want to do something that I found to be super useful when I talk to people. I want to sort of make sure that I expand your notion of the term reliability first, right? These are things that are, that are practices that are going to try to help us tend towards reliability by allowing us to have conversations in our organizations about objective data. Right, those conversations, because one thing that doesn't work in your organization is a discussion that goes like this. Uh, I'm going to come all the way back here just to mess with you. So if I come over here to Dick, oh good, it's a name I can pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to Dick, hey Dick, how do you think the, how do you think the reliability of our systems are th this, this month? What are you going to say? I'd say they're pretty good, but I don't have any quantitative means to... to okay, so you're going to say they're pretty good, but, but maybe it's the case that you're not wearing a name badge. I'm no, sorry. I, What's I your name? Do you have a name? Yeah, it's John Peter. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> So you might have a different opinion of, of, of what are things. And we may have these conversations that are like, hey, you know, like, are things good? I don't know. They might be good. So we want to really talk about objective data. So the way to get here is to think about reliability. But the thing is, is that reliability just isn't one thing. There are lots of aspects to it. And if I can expand your notion of it, then, and if you take that back to your, pla to your place of business, you will find that your world will be, I don't know, better at least. So the place that most people start when they think about reliability is availability. Is my system up? Is it down? Can I reach the website? Can the, is the server working? Right? And this is a perfectly fine place to start. And I think that this, if you spend most of your time in this bubble over here, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Because this is what we think of when we think of reliability often. But that's not the only one. Another one that's becoming more and more important is latency. The time between I send a request and I get the answer back, for example. Okay? And I don't know if there is a Dutch version of this, but my, one of my favorite sayings is, slow is the new down. Does that make sense? <laughs> Right? Because you and I all know that, let's say it's a website. If the website is too slow, I'm going to go to some other website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera right? So uh, it's really important to understand that latency is, is becoming more critical to us in terms of what are our expectations of our systems. Similarly, if we're not running a web server or something, and we're running some sort of pipeline system or bat system or whatever, we might care about throughput. How quickly do things move through the system? Or more precisely, in batches, we might care about, did we process the whole thing? What is the coverage? Correctness is a thing that I don't think we do a good job of measuring most of the time, and I would encourage you to think about this. Did the things that I set up to do do what they said they were going to do? Or what I wanted them to do? Am I checking for that? If you're not doing that in your environment, can I humbly suggest you should think about it a little bit? Like checking to make sure that that system ran and did what you expected it to do? Because that's part of reliability too. Oh, he got here. He's, he's here. Welcome. I have a seat right here for you. Oh, okay. I guess you can go over there too. As you can tell, see, see, this is the problem. As you can tell, I tend to mess with people. Um, I want to say also, it was very nice uh, for, for, for the introduction that says, please turn off your devices. Um, if you're on call and you have to run out of the room, like, well, that it was not planned. <laughs> that was really... <laughs> you are so suggestible. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand. I've been on call as well. However, if your alarm goes off and I like your ringtone, I might get to keep your phone. So, no pressure. Another thing that we might care about when it comes to reliability is fidelity. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, an example I can give is Netflix. So if you go to Netflix, which I, I assume we all know, yes? Um, the first thing on the page might be, here is Netflix's uh, recommendations for you, their personalized recommendations. There might be something that says, here's what people are starting to, are starting to stream. There might be something about, you know, here's coming soon. 
If there's a problem with one of their microservices, and they have so many microservices, I don't know if you've ever seen a diagram of it. The one for, let's say, the recommendation engine, and that's down. They, you don't go to Netflix and they'll go, sorry, we'll stream to you tomorrow, right? If the recommendation engine is down, what they will do is show you a page that is a degraded experience, for lack of a better term, where they've taken that piece out or they put something static in for that, right? And so what fidelity is, is that measurement of how often did I give you the full experience? Right? How often do they run in full mode versus degraded mode? And another sort of niche thing that you might think about is freshness. Right? If I'm running something that deals with sports scores or election results, it is really, really important to be measuring the freshness of what's going on here. And as a final thing, I don't know how many people in this room currently run a storage system. I certainly have. Um, it's super important. Yes, now's a great time to take a picture if you want, and I'm happy to go over here. Make, make whatever those faces the youngins make these days. Um, if you're running a storage system, it's... Oh, you want me to go? Oh, yeah, fine. Yeah, oh, no. Oh, yeah, great. For those of you who can't hear, I've just been asked to look intelligent. Um, rough crowd, rough crowd. Um, by the way, if you do want to tweet at me on things like this, you can reach me at Otterbook, which is that thing at the bottom there. That's, that's my handle there. Um, this was back, and Otterbook was, comes from the fact that, as Rudy was saying, I used to do Perl for system administration, and that's the Otterbook from O'Reilly, in case you're curious where that comes from. Ah, everyone's like, ah, oh, where do you get those weird words? Now you know. It all makes sense. Um, okay, but here's the thing I want to say to you about this whole diagram, something that's really important, and I'm so glad you came for the, right at the point you needed to. Um, I can take all these things that are part of reliability, but one thing that's really crucial to say, one of the things that I think if you were going to take something back from this talk, is that reliability has to be measured from the customer's perspective, not from the component perspective. I'm going to say that again. You have to measure reliability from the customer's perspective, not the component perspective. And to make sure that I'm driving that point home, we're going to do a little quiz. Congratulations, everybody in this room is now in charge of an e-commerce website that sells, I don't know, clouds or something. I know, I work for a company that sells clouds, I don't see why you don't. Um, cloudy thingy. Yeah, a cloudy thingy, yeah. So you run an e-commerce system that, 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 run, that, that, uh, you know, that runs out there, and this e-commerce system consists of 100 backends. And yes, it is incredibly tedious to put 100 of anything on a slide in PowerPoint, but here I'm from Microsoft, and uh, you know, we, we, we extend our PowerPoint love to you. So, Thank you. So, um, so let's imagine that something goes wrong. Maybe there's a problem with the power systems. Maybe you uh, have a software update that goes awry or a firmware update that goes awry. And unfortunately, 14 of these machines burst into flame. OK? So now we have a situation where 14 of these machines are down. 86 of them are fine, but 14 of them are down. Quiz time. Are you ready? This is the Utrecht logo, everything is down. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a weird thing to be proud of, but okay. <laughs> okay, um, I really like you people. Uh, okay, here comes the quiz. Are you ready for a quiz, yes or no? Yeah, okay, good. That's when I answer a question, you answer, that's the way it works, Q&A. Because you're gonna ask me questions later, I'm gonna answer them, so let's, let's do it together. Okay, here we go, here's your quiz. Is this situation, and I'm going to remind you, 86 things are up, 14 are down. Is this A, no big deal? Is it, I'll come off the beach when I feel like it, but please can I have another fruity drink in a coconut with a paper umbrella? Is it, or two paper umbrellas? See, the problem is that we're going to have this conversation on the, with the front row that's not going to benefit either of us. Um, <laughs> yes, sir? The answer is on your shirt. Can I finish the question? <laughs> Here, here, here is my thing, pretty please. I appreciate, how, I appreciate how wrapped into this you are, and no spoilers, please. Is the situation no big deal, I, have to come off, I can come off the beach when I feel like it and deal with this, is it I should walk to my desk right now and get those 14 servers back up, or is it an existential crisis, I should slam my hand down, on, this is not a button, but I should slam my hand down on the big red button, I should wake the CEO and the other C whatever's um, up from their sleep and get them in here, and we, this is all hands on deck. 
Okay, now we're going to vote. <laughs> Let's just pretend it was five minutes ago. Now we're, <laughs> now we're going to vote. How many people think the situation is A? Uh, can I finish? <laughs> okay, good. So I see the percentage of people have hands up. Okay, great. How many people think it's B? We should work to our desk and do that. Okay, I would say there's more, more of that. Okay, how many people think the answer is C? Everyone's just keeping their hands up. You can put them down between if you want, of C. <laughs> so there are a few people who think the answer is C. So here's what I've come to say. I know it's gonna be a big surprise to you. <laughs> please, uh, please bear with me for this and, and you're all sitting, right? Um, yes, in my opinion, indeed it depends. Why is this funny? You knew it was coming. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad we're here. You just missed a joke. <laughs> Ask the person next to you what was funny. Um, it depends. If none of your customers noticed that you had any machines down at all because this is the way you've engineered it, then no big deal. It's more closely aligned to A, right? If, in fact, uh, nothing is working and you're losing money uh, just by, just, you know, every minute you're losing more and more money, it might be a C situation. You can imagine it could be closer to B, right? So it really depends. And that's because we need to measure reliability from the customer's perspective, not the component perspective. When I told you 86 were up and 14 were down, that is for sure true. That is for sure good data, but it's not the important piece of the data in this conversation. Are we all ready to move on? Everyone's like, whoa. Or they're just impressed by the fact that I wear this shirt. Um, okay, service level indicators, SLIs. So service level indicators take, start with that, this wonderful diagram of various aspects of reliability. We're gonna use this sort of thing. And basically it's trying to come up with what are the metrics we're gonna use to determine whether things are working the way we expect. What are we going to measure? So for example, if I were doing something with like a website, what I might want to do is say, okay, well, for availability, I care about the number. No, no, don't take a picture yet. Um, I might care, <laughs> just warning you. I might care about the total number of HTTP calls, but more importantly, I might care about the number of successful HTTP calls. And that's a ratio. Okay, now I'm gonna do a bit of math that is difficult in the US, but I suspect the Netherlands schools can handle it. <laughs> I might be right. Yes, it certainly does depend. I believe you me. Um, I can take this ratio and I can multiply it by 100 to get a proportion. I know you were expecting like something with like a, like a, I know everyone's like, whoa, yeah, good thing I went to school. Um, so for example, if I have a ratio of 0.5, I multiply it by 100, we get to 50%. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm just trying to show you, okay? So, okay, so that gives you some idea. And I can do this again with other things. I can do this with latency if I want to. So I can say the number of, the number of uh, operations that are completed in less than 10 milliseconds over the total number of operations, I get some sort of ratio, I multiply it, congratulations, I get an 80% number. Okay, that's what SLIs are. Now, here's the thing. Lots of stuff about reliability, but what I've just told you for constructing an SLI still leads things more fuzzy than they need to be. There's still something here that I'm leaving out that's absolutely crucial. And I know that this slide messes with you, so I will do this, because what we really want to do is have as much clarity as possible. Now I know you feel better. We can, we can go back and forth between these two if you want to make it like an eye exam. Um, what I've left out of this that's really important when it comes to SLIs is where are we doing the measuring? Okay, let me be explicit about that. If I were to, for example, come over here and Let's say I, I'm going to pretend you're the server. You're a speaker, so you can be the server today. Um, I come over and look at the, the data at the server. That might be a completely different number than if I come over here to Rudy, and let's say Rudy is the load balancer, which I think is probably true. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, right? Because if we look at these two numbers, the information on the server only shows the data that got to the server. 
right? If you have a problem with your network, then that which this, what's on the server doesn't necessarily represent the total number of anything. So the key thing is if we're going to have this conversation about, uh, about objective data, it's really important that we are talking about the same thing. So how do we do that? We just simply put it in. We say, as measured at the server or as measured at the load balancer. Or for latency, we might say something like, as measured at the client. So far, so good? I know that's difficult. I get that part. We can talk about that too if you want. So, okay, so here's the deal. The goal is to be able to have these conversations. Now, the next thing that people typically ask me when it comes to SLIs is, okay, that's awesome, thank you for telling me that. Where do I do this measurement? You just told me I can measure it wherever I want, right? I need to measure it. So um, here's the good news, you have a choice. Here's the bad news. In order to use that choice, you have to understand the trade-offs, like the one I was just talking about when we were measuring between these two. Okay? The one piece of advice I might give you is to go back to that original concept that says, maybe what you want to do is try to measure this information as close to the customer or the customer's experience as possible. Make sense? OK, so now that we have this thing to measure, now that we have this thing that says 50% availability, we have a problem here. We don't know whether 50% is good or is it bad. It might be great. We might be exactly what we might be hitting our targets great. So now we have to set some sort of objective. And that's where an SLO or a service level objective comes in. So it, let's say I might want to take any of these things of reliability and I might want to know over a week, how did I do? Or I might want to do it over a month. Again, the magic of PowerPoint. So here's how we do that. There's a basic, there's a basic recipe that I can use. Say again. Wait, do I? <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. It's, it's strange to me, too. I just want to be very clear about this. <laughs> the, first, the first three months I was, I was working for Microsoft and I was on stage and said I work for Microsoft, I would turn around to see who said that. Because <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me at all. So, but obviously, I'm not selling you anything from Microsoft yet. <laughs> no, um, I'm not actually selling anything at all. Um, OK, so here's how the recipe would go. Let's make a cake. Um, the first thing that we're going to want to care about when we're coming up with an objective is what's the thing that we're talking about, the HTTP request, storage checks, operations. Then we're going to do that, that difficult math where we're going to try to say, what is our desired proportion? right, F up 50% of the time, or could read 99.9% .9 of the time, or, 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 or you know, it returns in a certain amount of time. Again, there's one piece of p information that's left out here, you can guess by the little symbol up there, is that we have to state what the time window is, what the time horizon that we're talking about. We have to say, we're measuring this over the last 10 minutes, or the last quarter, or very often in SLOs we will talk about the rolling 30-day window. The reason why we do that instead of doing calendar months is to make sure that we're looking at the same amount of data every month. But sometimes you have to do it by like fiscal quarters. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, so here's an example. We might say 90% of HTTP requests, as reported by the load balancer, succeeded in the last 30-day window. Make sense? Is that a clear statement? Like when you look at that, if you're having a conversation with someone, I mean, yes, there's, there's, there's ambiguity you can put in there if you really want to, but that's enough of a statement where you're getting some idea of what's going on here. Right? I can do that again for latency pretty easily. I can say 90% of HTTP requests as reported by the client, again, where did I measure it, returned in 20 milliseconds in the last 30-day window. Great. So that's SLOs, but what do we do with them? What do you do with them? Well, SLOs are more often than not um, a work planning uh, tool, but one thing you could do with them as part of that is you could say, okay, I've got my SLI and SLO that I've just figured out. Now what I'm going to do is put it in my monitoring system. And it is absolutely crucial that you put it in a place where there's a single point of truth. You want everybody to be able to look at the same set of numbers, and you want everybody to believe them. If your monitoring system isn't up to it, if people say, hey, you're missing the data from Thursday, um, this is not going to work. Right? You want people to look at the same place and be able to trust it. Once you have that stuff, then we can start making these engineering decisions. Let's say it's time to release a new version of our software. And we, we say we have an SLO of 80%. And we look at the data, and it says we've been up 90% of the time. Well, go ahead. Maybe it's time to go ahead and release that new version. But what if we've only been up 60% of the time? Well, we might choose at that time, and again, this is a choice, to gate that release, to say, whoa, we're going to spend a little bit of time and energy to figure out what happened. What's going wrong? Why don't we have it instrumented so we know what's going wrong? We can make that choice. 
And this is one of the things you can do with SLIs and SLOs. Because the goal, again, is to have this conversation um, in your organization. In my experience, just starting to have this conversation in your organization can change the way people work with the right people, talking about this sort of stuff. Um, since you folks are all as old as I am, if you remember the days of configuration management, back in the time when we were first starting on the land of B config and Puppet and uh, uh, CF, Engine. CF Engine, thank you, that's the one I was reaching for. I am old. Um, uh, it, it, you know, Chef, et cetera, where we had to sit down and say, what is web server? How, what means web server, right? And we have to get in a room and say, oh, well, a web server is this. It has this, these, these things installed on it and stuff like that. Same deal here. If you get in a room with people, with the people that are writing the software, the people that are paying for the software, with uh, the people that have to operate the software, and you have these conversations, it will change the way your culture goes. Um, it's not magic. It's not pixie dust. I can't say congratulations if you have a terrible, terrible culture where people keep a knife in their boot you know, for meetings et cetera, that this is going to change that, right? It's not going to turn your prison yard into, into like, Disneyland, um, which is probably not a, a good analogy, but, um, but it might help, is what I want to say. Okay, so let's talk about operational balance, which you're going to intuitively understand as being from just being Dutch, I anticipate, but we'll find out. This is the idea that it is important to be able to spend a good proportion of your time not only responding to things, not only dealing with tickets and pages and stuff like that, but also getting the time to do the work to improve the reliability of the system. Right? If you spend all your time on what we would call in the SRE field toil, um, I guess it's a, a common word, but toil in the SRE field means that work which is repetitive, which is manual, and which brings no, no lasting value to the business. You can do it as much as you want, but, the, but things don't improve and nothing, nothing, there's no lasting value to it. If we spend all our time in toil, then, well, we're going to have a horrible life and things aren't going to get better. How's that for a really gloomy statement? Right? And I'm sorry for those of you who have got your head down like this, because I know I've been there. Right? But you have to strike an operational balance. If you're spending all your time in, reactive, in React mode and no time in Fix-It mode, you cannot improve the reliability of your system. It just doesn't happen by itself. So to that end, you kind of need some management support. You need somebody in the, in the organization to say, and I see people nodding and I apologize, um, you have to have somebody who's going to say, reliability is really important. I want you to spend some time. I know we have these tickets in the queue, but we need to, we need to get a handle on this. You need, you need some support to be able to do this. And if you're, the, if you're the, the management, then you need to offer the support to people. Okay? It's just really crucial. So and the last thing I want to say in terms, of, in terms of these practices is how do you learn from failure? So I can guarantee everybody in this room this, and it's not just because I am, I'm the prophet of doom or I, I have like this magic insight that you don't, that everybody in this room is going to experience failures in their systems at one time or another. I know how, I, as, great as, it, as great as they may be. And so the question is, are those failures, are those outages, are those downtimes strictly going to be a loss of money, reputation, time, health, et cetera? Or can you learn from them? Can you level up your operations practice by spending the time to get together in a room when you have a significant outage and have a discussion about what went on so you can learn from it? When you get in a room to have this discussion, that discussion has to be blameless. We're supposed to be spending our time figuring out what went wrong with our processes or our technology or whatever it was that led us to this outage. You cannot spend time in a room um, that is blameful. You cannot say, okay, we just had an outage. This guy here, I'm going to fire him. Okay, no, we had another outage. Yeah, he looks responsible, right? You can't be spending this time in blame because, quite frankly, you probably already know this, but you can't fire your way to reliability. It just doesn't work. You can, you know, if you fire somebody every time you have an outage, you get a team of zero and not a reliable system. Right? And I know we know this in this place, and I know we see it, but you've also probably been part of, and I apologize, a situation where basically it was, it was a, a, a blame-finding expedition. Who can we find to blame? What was, what was the human error? Who can we blame along this line? That's not what you need to do when you're trying to learn from failure. And we can go into that if you want to during question and answers, if you'd like. Okay, so the question might be, how do we start? 
Oh, we're doing great on time. Okay. How do you get started? So most of the time when people come to you and say, how do I start? They're asking the question, how does an organization start? But I'll also get to how you as a person start, if you want. So here's what I say when I talk about how organizations start. So what I'm going to do is give you a sense of um, what to do and in what order to do it. I'm going to give you a little bit of a map. The map that I like to use is something called the Dickerson Hierarchy of Reliability. So Mikey Dickerson was an SRE who was faced with a tremendous reliability challenge. Some of you, I hope most of you have not heard of, heard of healthcare.gov in the US. Um, but if you have, Mikey was the person who led the team that saved the US from itself. Uh, sorry, that saved the, the, that saved the website that was meant to be used for um, for signing up for, I know this sounds weird, healthcare in the US, if you didn't have it, uh, he was part of that team. And he came up with this thing, which is meant to be a riff on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't know how many people here have dealt with that. If you haven't, you should check it out, Abraham Maslow. So basically it says that I have this hierarchy where you know, we have these different levels, and in order to move up the pyramid, I have to make sure that each level is solid and doing what it needs to do and is correct before I move to the next level. Does it make sense? Because this is going to be crucial when I say that. Okay, so at the bottom of this is monitoring. You can be, not, I suppose, not surprised about this, but this is the thing that tells us, are thing, is things getting better or are things getting worse? Right, just to be there. Am I making a difference? Is there some change that I'm making and is it working? Without this, you are sunk. I know that some people in this room have great systems that are about monitoring, and I also know people in this room that have terrible monitoring systems. I know that. I have, interview I have interviewed at companies. I once interviewed at a company that I'm going to leave off the last, I mean, maybe it ended with the word where. Um, uh, sorry. That, uh, where I said to them, well, tell me about your monitoring system, which is something I do, and they said to me, well, we have this monitoring system, two people take care of it, and, but it's noisy and nobody pays attention to it. Where are you going to go with that? Right? How are you going to improve the reliability if nobody pays attention to your monitoring system? So this is crucial. Once you have your monitoring system in a good place, or your monitoring strata, or how, systems, whatever you want to say it, then you can talk about incident response. When something happens, what do we do? Do we all go around and going, ah, things are broken? You know, do we, do we not know, it? does every time, do we have an ad hoc response, so we're only reactive? Or do, we spend, or do we understand how to triage a problem? Do we understand how to get the right people involved, how to get it fixed or, back, or mitigate, mitigate it as fast as possible, et cetera? Okay? So, that's the next step. After you've done that, and after you've had a chance to take your seat, <clears throat> no worries. No worries. We, we were all here at that time. I don't know. <laughs> then you can talk about that learning from failure part. Then you can talk about the post-incident review. Do we learn from our failures? Okay? And I suspect that everybody can do better post-mortems or post-incident learning reviews or retrospectives or whatever it is you call the thing that you do. Right? This is a really crucial thing. I'm not done with my pyramid yet. Take as many pictures as you want, though. Once you do that, then we want to talk a little bit about testing and release processes and deployment. Can I prevent some of the things that have happened to me before they get to production, before they happen? Right? Can I create the pipeline? Can I do whatever is necessary? Can I get, do that so that, that we, it doesn't break? And then here's another thing that people don't really realize. Growth and scale can take your system down just as easily as anything else. A customer cannot tell the difference between your website is down because you have a bug in the code and your website is down because too many people are trying to use it and you didn't engineer for that. Right? So we have to spend some time on this growth and scale thing. And then there are two other parts of the pyramid that, my, that Mikey includes that we won't talk much about here at all. One of them is your development process and, and what that environment is like, and how do you do with sort of the user interface questions. Peachy, okay? So this is the picture. If you want another picture, again, I'm happy to take a... I'm going to go over here. Those poor, is there a particular pose you would like when you're going to take this picture? Don't do that. You're going you're to appeal to my vanity. Do not clap for that. Then I'm going to be spending all my time like... <laughs> okay? 
Okay, so how does an individual start? How do you get into this stuff if you think this is really cool? Well, in my experience, most people start because they have a problem at work. They have a bunch of downtime, they have a bunch of outages, they know they have to get on top of it, they need to deal with it, and someone says, go out and figure out what we're going to do. Or, very rarely, somebody has an epiphany, they jump out of the bath, and they say, Eureka, and they're like, aha, I want to be doing SRE stuff. I want to bring some SRE practices in before things are a problem. But in my experience, it almost never happens that way. It's usually something's a problem, you have to deal with it. <laughs> then, then it's that point about getting management support lined up. I have seen people do it in, by themselves in sort of a skunk work sort of way, um, but that's harder, a lot harder. Possible to do it without management support, possible to be a secret SRE, um, I suppose, or to do it this anyway, or to bring these things in without saying that it's SRE, totally fine, but a lot, it's a lot easier if your management buys in. Then the next thing to do is go learn. One place you can learn is one of these three books, or all three, three books. The first two books over here uh, uh, were description, dis descriptions, descriptions of Google's experience when they implemented SRE. And the second one gets a little more away from that as well, but attempts to have some discussion of what they did. Um, I helped uh, edit and curate a book that was meant to take that a little further and talk about more than just that. That was meant to talk about like, well, what happens when you take this thing that was developed initially in Google back in 2003 and put it in some other company? What happens when you take the same seed and you grow it in different soil? This was the question that I wanted to answer. Um, so I would say, go get these books and read them. But the thing I want to say to you about this is make sure you read these books critically. Do not spend the time like you're in a Bible study class and say, now let us read chapter 23 to each other, right? Or like a hymnal, right? You cannot just copy what Google did and expect it to work unless you're Google, right? So, or even my book, right? Go look at this stuff critically. What will work, what won't work in our environment? And that, that's definitely a question. Then once you have that, I suggest you spend some time with other SREs. That to me is absolutely crucial. You understand that, you're in a room with other people like you, you get that sort of stuff. One place you can do, which Rudy mentioned, is there's a conference that I helped co-found uh, that, that is up for SRE folks. Uh, the next one's in Amsterdam. I'm so happy to come back here, you have no idea. <laughs> right? So, so that's one thing I'd say. And then I'd, I'd say, tip your, tip your toes in to SLIs and SLOs. And try it out, with, try it out, and I can give you more advice about that as well. So I promised what I would do at the end of this, and I think we have, if I'm catching the time yet, do we have till 9.30? Oh, we have tons of time, great, so I left a lot of time for that. To have a discussion of any sort. This is sort of an ask me anything. I'm happy to talk about anything that I've talked about here. I'm happy to talk about, oh yeah, I guess there's a mic that we can use. Um, I'm happy to talk about the differences between SRE and, and DevOps or anything else. I'm happy to tell you where I get my shirt because obviously people are really into it. Um, and happy to answer other questions. I'm happy to tell you what it's like with Microsoft. Last night, somebody asked me, or the night before, where did the animals come from on the book? Happy to talk about that. You know, any, direct, any questions you have, I'm going to take for this period of time. To me, what's interesting about these talks is not me talking to you, because I can talk to me anytime I want, because I'm here. Um, you know, but having this conversation with people and discussing the things that they're interested in about this sort of stuff. So um, the only thing I would ask you to do is if you have a question, please form the question in the form of a question. Because, um, uh, you know, those, those, those conferences you go to and it's like, I don't have a question, but I, I do have something I want to say are not great. Um, I'm happy to hear that later. But let's, so let's pick it up with, with this person here first. Hit me. You mentioned getting management support. Completely agree. Do you have any tips in actually achieving that so the beyond the house burning down? Okay. So the question is, what do you do in a situation where the house is burning down, and how do you help your management understand that they have to pen, spend some time on this sort of stuff? In my experience, management has a good sense that... Uh, things should get better, right? I don't know management that says, I'm enjoying the fact that things are terrible. Um, let's keep that up, right? It's not like The Good Place, which I'm enjoying to watch. If you haven't seen that show, it's really lovely. Um, you know, where, where the design is to torture you, right? Um, so in my experience, they're, they're already looking for something. And I, liked, I think that sometimes having somebody say, here's a map, or here's a thing that we should be paying attention to, if we spend some time here, we're going to reap that benefits immediately. That's my experience is lots of companies are coming to SRE because they realize reliability is, in fact, important to us. They've had a problem. 
So um, I'd say talk nicely to them. I would also say understand that the systems and processes you have in your environment now are there for a reason. When they were put in place, they, 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 they were put in for good reason. Very seldom do people come up with arbitrary things in their environment. Um, but sometimes those have timed out. Maybe their expiration date is, is a little old. So for example, um, it is awesome that you have a great ticketing system. It is terrible for reliability to rely on your ticketing system. And just say, my SREs are the level three people. And we just wait till we escalate it far enough up to the SREs. If you expect to have reasonable, uh, reasonable figures in terms of how up your thing are, doing things, you know, and you look at like some number of nines, if you have that particular fetish, um, uh, you have like four minutes. How much time of those four minutes is like somebody filling it into a ticket system and it goes to somebody else who goes to somebody else who goes to somebody else. So we have to start to let go of that sort of thing, is what I'd say. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Okay, well, you, you, you can run the mic and I'm just going to sit here and answer. By the way, I'm hoping that you disagree with me. Disagree with me whenever you feel like it. I like it. Sir. Hello. Do you um, see any like operational uh, or organizational um, uh, prerequisites to start with Esri? Because if you're like in a thousand people company and you're the only one reading the book, uh, it can be pretty hard to start. Yeah, so, so the question was, I'm just gonna repeat it back in my own terms. Um, are there any prerequisites to getting started with the SRE stuff? Um, if you're the only person who's got the religion in the, in, in the company, how do you deal with that, that sort of stuff? Um, so I'm gonna say that we've talked about some of them. I think um, that uh, a prerequisite, one of these like you have to be this tall to ride, sort of things, is in fact around the lines of monitoring and the, and, and the willingness to, to look at reliability per se. So I'd say in an organization, um, I didn't say anything about how you can implement it in different organizations because it's different in different organizations. It's very different uh, how we do it at Microsoft from how they do it in Google, from how they do it in Facebook or, or, or smaller, smaller places. So that's thing number one is to just understand it has to fit in with your company culture. So I would say, Find other people in your environment who are similarly minded and, and get together and talk about this stuff is one thing. But have your monitoring solid first because everything else is going to follow from there. So I think that's my, my first. I think that's my first answer. I might have other answers later. Um, oh, now I remember the other thing I wanted to say. I don't think that you need to get involved in SRE by becoming one, by hiring one. You can bring some of these practices into your environment without ever saying the letters S, R, and E next to each other, right? If you were to do the SLI, SLO things and say, hey, I have this idea. Why don't we sit down and figure out what we mean by reliable and what we expect it to be and what's appropriate? If you have a discussion about appropriate but you never say SRE, you will be on a good path. And when it starts to have these benefits because you'll be setting up this virtuous feedback loop, then, you'll be, then people will be more and more interested, like, hey, what was the thing you did with that over there? I want one of those. Can we talk about that? Can we have that kind of conversation? Et cetera. So that would be what I would say along those lines. Next, please. Um, so I work for an organization that makes uh, popular open source uh, products. What can we do to make the life of people that do SRE better? So I would have to know what the product is. I mean, I, I really appreciate where that's coming from. Um, the short answer to that question is uh, people need, so this is another interesting thing. One of the things that open source has going for it that sometimes is trickier in other organizations is the opportunity to have everybody be able to look at the source code. And so when there's a problem, somebody who is an SRE, like if I'm an SRE and my job is to help make things better, I can figure out where the problem is. It can be an anti-pattern if you have this situation where the SREs in your organization or people doing SREs in your organization don't have source code access or even, doesn't, or not, you know, I don't even just commit, but can't even see the source code for your product, right? Then they're, then they're sort of hamstrung and there's not a lot you can do. So what you can do as an open source thing is to be um, aware of and to do, just like you might do a security audit, there might be also value in doing a little bit of a reliability audit and figuring out how do we tell people, here's how I use this product. I don't know what product it is. If you told me that, then I can, I can, I can be less riffy. So we make uh, DNS software and software for um, routing. Do, do people use, D I mean, is DNS software important? No, I not at all. I, no. <laughs> I'm, I, I rarely know any people that use it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can print the T-shirt that says it's always DNS, yeah. and uh, <laughs> that's what you can do for me if you really want to know. Um, 
So, so, right, so you're smack in the middle of this sort of stuff. So I would say instrumenting things well, understanding and putting out really good stuff that describes the patterns for use from a reliability, reliability perspective is really good. Um, it would be really awesome if you yourself stayed up. Um, <laughs> That would be another thing that would be really good along these lines, is what I would say. I think that, that open source is a really, in, is a really interesting, like open source companies are really interesting sort of niche here that we can go into sort of later along the lines. It's, there's things that are different about it than there are sort of the enterprise sort of stuff that we can go into. But uh, I'm really happy you're asking the question, let's put it that way. So next person, please. Hi. Whoa. Uh, hello. Uh, maybe a follow-up. So we also make open source DNS software, but not with, with him. Do you hate uh, them? <laughs> no. No, 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 we're, we're, we're good friends. Yeah, uh, so, Am I going to have uh, to separate the two of you? No, no, no. So, so how would you do this um, across uh, different organizations? So we built the software, we help deploy it at customer sites. Yeah. So, but how would you, uh, and we, we try to, 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 to deliver some monitoring, some automation around that, but how would you get the other organization to embrace this style of, of working. Presumably so. you don't mean that his, his organization, right? No, no, okay. no. So no, our, you just so mean, our, you mean our like customers, your customers. How, how can we make yeah, them so, make so, them Yeah, right, so here's the good news. The good news is that this is sort of the same pattern you might have in a larger organization where you have lots and lots of development groups, et cetera, and the question you're asking is, well, how do I make sure that SRE is useful across the entire organization? You're just taking, instead of it being one large organization, you're, you're thinking about it as a bunch of little distributed organizations. You have the opportunity to be part of what I would call a reliability strata, right? Where you can provide the pieces and the work and the processes and the best practices that multiple customers can start to use that can feed information in. You can also tell people from your experience, what is it that I've learned from operating our software in this place and that place? You can be really transparent about outages associated with your software that say, here's what's happened, here's what we did with it, here, so that other people can learn from it. So stuff like that, to my mind, is absolutely invaluable. And doing it at sort of the macro level instead of doing it in, in, in like an organizational uh, thing is incredibly valuable and would be uh, amazing, is what I would say. Like, have that vision. Have that vision that you're gonna try to take what you learn in one place and put it other places. Be that connective system between different situations. Okay, and then the two of you should get together and, and merge your code base. <laughs> See, I'm making friends. Are there questions? There is here, here, and here, which is great. Oh, well. Uh... Maybe you all say it all at once and I'll see what I can do. Oh. So, this is Ask You Anything. What's the story behind the eyes on your laptop? What eyes? What are you talking about? Uh, what's the story there? Um, that's just me being a nut. Uh, I mean, the short version is, is that this is uh, something that gets sold by a company called Adafruit, um, if you've never seen it, which is meant to be used in costuming and stuff. So if I wanted to, I could break it at the bridge, and I could bring it over here, I could wear it, um, I could put it into a costume, and I just thought it might be interesting. Like, you stare at me all the time, I figure, like, why not, you know. It's, it's probably like X-Eyes 2.0. Uh, yeah, it's very funny. Oh, boy, you're, boy we're old, aren't we? Um, I can also do, I can also do, I can also, if you really want, put different eyes up. If that would make you happy, but this is my calm set of eyes. And someday what I'll do is make this thing watch the temperature of the room and change it, stuff like that. We can talk about it later. It's a total, it's, I'm just, I just thought it would be fun. It's a short answer. There's no, there's no deep meaning to it, I wish I could say. Okay. Um, what are the core competences of an SRE? Or um, um, can I mix the competences uh, in a team? Uh, what do we need? Yeah, so um, it's very funny that you ask that because uh, it dovetails to a question that I get asked a lot, which is, uh, and I'm, not, I'm really going to answer your question, but like people ask me on a fairly regular basis, so how does Microsoft do SRE? And the answer is because uh, we are so big and there's so many different parts of it and, we do, and we, it's kind of balkanized that we are internally trying to figure out that answer. Um, and one of the questions that came up as part of that is, what are the things that people who do SRE have to understand? Um, some of the stuff is obvious, right? Some of it is to have really good technical troubleshooting skills. Some of it is to have that mindset about, about uh, looking and understanding failure and understanding failure modes. I think as, as 
systems become more and more complex, we have to have some good experience with distributed systems. In, in my experience, and understand how they fail and what the failure modes in, the, in those cases are. Um, I think it's really important, I'm sorry to say this, that we all understand how to read and ideally write code. Right? If you can't do that, if you can't look at stuff from a software architectural background, um, then you're not going to be as helpful. Like, like a really helpful SRE can go, I think your garbage collection system over here is, is terrible. Here's what I think would make it better. Right? That's a useful piece of information besides that says, I think that's broke, um, and every, every night it runs out of memory. Right? Like, so you, so you want to be able to, you want to get there. Um, one of the things that was said earlier is, I'm not going to tell you how to go from system in to SRE. I don't think it's like this evolutionary journey. Like, once upon a time, we were, we were tadpoles, and now, you know, then we started to walk up right and we became sysadmins, and then we became DevOps people. And now, someday, if you, everybody in this room works really hard, you're going to become an SRE. That's not the way it works. Right? These are all parallel um, op tracks of operational evolution. Right? So I'm not going to tell you that you should all become an SRE. I don't think so. I'm all, I'll tell you ways not to become an SRE if you want. So I think that it's, it's the stuff that we were talking about. The thing that distinguishes SRE from some of the other operational things is that singular focus on reliability to pay attention to and how everything falls out of that, is what I would say. Next question, Steve will play. Uh, hello, Bert van Doors here. Um, not a very nice question, but when are you going to roll out SRE at Microsoft? So, so no, it's, a, it, it's actually a great question. It's a great question, and the short answer to that question is, um, I don't know. Um, so it, depends, it also depends on what you mean. If you're saying, when are we going to provide products that seem to be, that, that, well, for example, there's a product called Azure DevOps, if that's what you're thinking. Um, when is there going to be an Azure SRE? I'm certainly working with people internally to do this. It would be very, very, very helpful to me if people in this room told me what they wanted that to, what would be useful to them from, this, from, from the perspective that we could build that would be great along those lines. Um, internally, we do a bunch of SRE, and there's SRE, you know, like, you, you know, like uh, all, Azure is all run by SRE, Office 365 is run by SREs, all the share, I'm sorry to bring these names, names up, SharePoint, et cetera, like that's all run by SRE groups, that, 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 that's, that's part of that. Um, but what do we do to make it easier for SREs is part of what my job is is figuring that out. And um, if you have a really good answer to that, tell me so I can use it, is <laughs> what I want to say internally. So yeah, it's not a terrible question. It's exact. Demand that of everybody. I don't care who gets up in front of this. Well, maybe you shouldn't talk to the people that aren't involved in that sort of stuff, but, but demand that of, of all your vendors, of all these people. When are you going to do something that makes life better for SREs? That's what I hope you would do. So not an not a, not a unnice question at all. But you have an unnice question. Well, I don't know. <laughs> so. Uh, um a lot of times I run into people that think that the world is too complex. And they say, this is too complex. I don't want to have uh, 25 different metrics. And I don't want to know about all the complexity. Just give me one number. Mm. Um, so my question is, how do you handle unattainable goals? <laughs> well, I'm glad that we have easy questions here in, <laughs> in the Netherlands. Uh, well, you're saying two different things. You're asking the question of how do you deal with complexity, and you're asking the question of how to deal with people that themselves are complex, um, I think is the way I'm going to split your question. So I think that um, I'm actually spending a lot more time these days thinking about what complexity means and what, we, what do we mean by complexity. Because there's some notion, that sa there's some notion and that there's a really good talk by Casey Rosenthal that, uh, that I can point you at if you send me mail. I mean, I'll tell people how to get to me now. here. I'll, I'll do this if that helps. Um, to, to get hold of me, you can catch me on Twitter. Or you can actually send me email if you want at, at Microsoft. Um, uh, send me mail, and I'll point you to this talk in which he talks about the fact that there is unintended complexity and there's sometimes there's required complexity. So for example, um, if I want to make this laptop more, more reliable, I might need two of them and now I've got more complexity. And that's required and that's necessary. So explaining to people and understanding, explaining that is useful. The other thing is to understand where they're coming from. I get that feeling of being overwhelmed. I get that feeling of this is too hard and I have to pay attention to it. Um, sometimes you have to tell them there's no easy path. Um, unfortunately, and sometimes you have to say, well, here, uh, it's only complex until we work through this, and then, then, it then that will immediately become whatever to you. Um, how do you deal with, un how do you people who are, um, they themselves not willing to talk about this sort of stuff? 
uh, my spouse is at home. Um, you could ask her. Uh, you know, we've had to figure that out over 28 years of marriage. Um, you know, what it's like to deal with an unreasonable person. So. <laughs> Yeah, how do you replace it? Well, so talking with customers are also tricky. Um, I really always start from the place of wherever I can of empathy, right? I've been doing this long enough that I understand when somebody says to me, your thing is terrible, or I don't understand how to use this, or whatever, and I take that as, as a failure of my part, um, of explanation of, of, of et cetera. I also realize that there are some people for which um, uh, not playing is the best way to win, you know, like to use the war games analogy, you know, so, so there, this is a complex conversation that we should have later, is what I want, what I want to say. So, next. Okay, thank you. Well, the, the good thing, well, it's, it's almost Are we time. Done? And we have the, five good, the good thing of announcing the speaker is that you can ask the last question. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'll be you, here under the desk, Rudy, if you need me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were talking about SLIs and SLOs, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned the monitoring system. Mm -hmm. uh, does this imply that your SLO on monitoring should be 100% in order to be talking about Yeah, who SLOs? watches the watchers is your question? Yeah. So um, How do you cope with that? It is very, I think it is reasonable to say that your monitoring system has to, well, you do everything you can to make, to make your monitoring system as reliable as possible. That includes, the way we talk about those at Microsoft is we talk about certain things that are dial tone systems, like it must always be up, and it must not be reliant on other things in the infrastructure. Um, so you have to engineer as best you can for that, um, be it through redundancy, fault tolerance, and et cetera. So there is some implication there. But just understand this, that SLIs and SLOs aren't like, if in fact there was a glitch in your monitoring system around SLIs and SLOs, probably fine, right? You know, just to be understand, there's an appropriate level here. It has to be good enough to serve its needs for you. If it is, if it's got the data and, and, and it is as close to level, but it's down for four minutes a year, probably fine. Or whatever it is, is what I would say along those lines. Okay, thank you. In, in along your, your, your shirt, so your mileage may vary. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So I guess I want to say that I'm going to be around this entire day. Um, I have been really thrilled today to have the opportunity to talk with you and to discuss this stuff and to play with you a little bit. Um, like, this is phenomenal. I hope to see you uh, when I'm back here in Amsterdam. Please don't hesitate to come talk to me either afterwards or whenever is good or contact me if you don't feel comfortable doing it in public um, or with a group around. Feel free to talk to me no matter what works. I really like talking about this stuff and I really, really appreciate you having me here uh, in Utrecht. It's been really, really great. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Oh. Okay, and uh, as I know that you're flying with only carry-on, I will <laughs> give you another problem and something nice. So that's your problem. Oh, it's Stu <laughs> Oh, I love Stu Poplin. And, no, 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 no. and, and bec because we're old, uh, I have to... Oh, write. I see. Share you this. Oh, okay. So I'm going to hold this up just so I can prove how old I am. <laughs> so it's a book that says Unix, a History and a Memoir by Brian Cunningham. Um, I would also highly recommend you see the movie. It's really good. It's Thank joke. you. <laughs> Thank you, folks.